inspired by multiple people in the room. Uh, this is a session on burnout. You're not a candle, so please don't burn out. Uh, my name is Michael. No, wow. that's not me. Uh, <laughs> Evidently not. That is not me. My name is Michael, and I'm going to grab a, a slide advancer. Uh, I work for the University of Michigan. I'm a member of the Drupal security team. I'm a member of the Drupal Infrastructure Working Group. I may be the only member of the Drupal Infrastructure Working Group at this point. <laughs> Um, or I should say the only volunteer member. Uh, I support approximately 1,300 Drupal sites at the University of Michigan. If you've been to a University of Michigan site, it's like quite likely I am the one responsible for the hosting behind it or some aspect of it. I don't know where I put my clicker. You wonder why he gives us a session about burnout. Yeah, it's a session about burnout, and I've sites. clearly already lost things. So, okay, well. Well, you should... did give it to them this morning, but they give yeah, it to Yeah, they give it back. Um, I do a lot of stuff at the University like... of Michigan with. It's fine. I do a lot of stuff with the University of Michigan. And... Why are you stepping on things? <laughs> Not on purpose. Uh, at, with the University of Michigan and large scale data, uh, I'm responsible for. Uh, three classes at the university, four classes at the University of Michigan, soon potentially be a fifth on Agile Project Management, Drupal, and SQL. Uh, I've got my hands in a lot of pots, is the point here. Also presenting with me, although not standing up here. It's because you pace. I don't really, okay, I'll pace. Um, <laughs> so I currently work as a developer programs engineer. My name is Fatima. Uh, you know me on the internet as Sugar Overflow, so feel free to tweet at me during this presentation. Uh, I'm currently and just recently hired by Pantheon on developer relations, so I'm a developer programs engineer. What that means is I write code, write documentation, go to events, talk to people, uh, kind of bridge the gap between the platform and the community that we work in. Uh, basically, he put my LinkedIn profile here. I used to work for Code for Canada, doing drone policy with Transportation Canada in Ottawa, and I have done core contribution, mentoring, and a lot of work in the Drupal community. I'm not the leader anymore. <laughs> it False says, advertising. It says past. Ah, uh, okay, cool. Past. Okay. I used to be the leader of the diversity and inclusion working group. Okay, let's move right along. So why are we here today? Uh, we're here to talk about uh, a problem that is fundamental to anybody who's doing any work anywhere, and that is burnout. Uh, in tech, we have specific issues around burnout. Um, but before we start, we're going to address what I feel is one of the primary uh, activities or causes of burnout through an activity. And for this activity, you will need some type of device, preferably a computer, but a phone will work. And I've got some assumptions. Everyone is not colorblind. You'll need to not be colorblind for this activity to work. Uh, you'll need to know how to read. You'll need to know how to count. And you'll need to know your ABCs, as in like the alphabet. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you get the idea here. So, we're gonna do a little game. I'm gonna give you a game that requires your brain to task switch. For this game to work, you will need to open up a web page on your device, and you're gonna be asked to fill in a column. And the columns are gonna go one through 10, a through Z, and then Roman numerals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, uh, on up. It looks something like this when you're done. I don't know if this is the right order or not. And so when I put the URL up, which I'm going to do in a second, I'm going to give people about four minutes to go as far as they can while doing this. So in order for your brain to do this, you have to multitask. You're going to have to task switch. It's really easy to count to 10. It's kind of difficult to count to one, and then count to A, and then count to Roman numeral one, and then go back to B, Roma two, and Roman numeral C. Yeah, see, I'm having problems standing up here. Yeah, so. because what's going to happen is you only get a row at a time, so you have to do the first row, and then the second row will appear for you. Um, that so. wasn't obvious when I did it. <laughs> I was like, oh, well, why is this hard? Um. So here's the URL. Umish.fyi slash WIP. We're going to give you, I don't know, two or three minutes to do this. Okay. She and I may walk around and check on people's yeah, status. No, so if you're not actually doing this, we may be looking at your screens, assuming that we, you're not doing this. So I'm going to play the professor role. And walk I apologize in advance. And like, you know, make sure people are paying attention. It's so uh, It does ask for your phone number. It will take any phone number. You don't have to give your phone number. <laughs> so this it's, data it's is not so Roman so number one. one. Why'd you start with two? <laughs> John, no. Roman Where's your head one? at? Capital A's. Yeah. Yeah. You totally told me. And then an A. What? On the end. 
And then if you tab or press that tab, you have to tab to get or click out the field. <laughs> you can kill them if you click on them. Oh, but no, be, why are bugs? Never kill. No, no, no bugs. I would never kill. Why do you think I didn't? Why is this not tab accessible? Okay, there it goes. It's intentionally not easy to use. Oh, okay. He's like, what? what's with the plus? I'm missing focus. This is not accessible. It is intentionally not easy to use. One. Yeah, you go further than I did. I thought it was a real bug. I had a little panic attack. It's easy to use if you can. Oh, it does not work on mobile version. You can tab from the left right to the next. Yes, but I cannot. So go ahead and tab into that. It's bootstrapping it. Bootstrap is doing anything. Why is there? It's distracting. Okay, take another minute and finish up. Sorry about the bugs. I don't like the bugs. I don't like the bugs. What am I doing? So for the first column, you want to click on the bottom screen. I don't like the fact that there's dead bugs sitting on the bottom of the screen. It gives me wrong answers if I click on the bugs. Why are you doing this to me? It'll open you ignored, but you have to click on it to edit to physically. Instructions could use work. Alright, thank you. Pull requests are open. Alright. Whoa, someone got really far. There are people whose brains are really good at doing this. Mine is not one of them. Okay. The bugs just. Really We're going to go to the next activity while I deal with tabulating those numbers. We're going to play one other game. You're going to need somebody sitting close to you. You can do this in groups of two, is the easiest way to do it. Um, you're going to read the words on the page out loud three times as fast as you can. So, for example, orange, blue, green. Yeah, yes, yes. So, turn to the person next to you, look at the screen, and go for it. All right. All right. Danny, you get to the offer. You should stop this other activity right here. Yeah, it's just going to enjoy yourself. Here we go. Orange, blue, green, pink, orange. Yes, it's super like that. Yellow, green, blue, green, blue, purple, yellow, orange, green. Wait, green. This is not even a color. Green, red, white, green, pink, blue, red, blue, orange, red, blue, purple, red, purple, orange, gray, red, green, blue, purple, pink, yellow, green, 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 so I go backwards from the bottom? Yeah. yeah. All right, yeah. Wait, no, no, hold on. Are we reading the words or are we reading the color? You can read it on the gray. You're reading the color of the font. How can it be zero? Well, you can have that. Oh, yeah, I got a zero on this one. Green, blue, gray, white. Okay. We're going to now do this in reverse. All right. Yeah, that's difficult. I want you to say the color that the font I can cheat. Ha ha. No. Vision, I can it's see just, color. Just take my glasses uh, yeah. off. Pink, that green, is so blue, cool. gray, white, red, gray, red, uh, green, red, orange. Uh, yeah, that, that one went white. Uh, blue, 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 blue. So, blue. it's pretty clear that the first one was a much easier way to go. Uh, the average on the first activity was 77 seconds with 20 errors. 200 seconds with 45 errors, and the best was 40 seconds with four errors. Multitasking. Raise your hand if you multitask. <laughs> Are you good at it? How many people think they're actually good at multitasking? Okay, we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna try to dissuade you from that today. The perception of people's ability to multitask was found to be ridiculously inflated. I'm paraphrasing this research study here. Um, people, who were multitasking would, would, would judge themselves to be above average in their ability, and these estimates had almost no grounding in their reality. Um, do you like multitasking? No. No? No. It's because usually at the end of the day, it's like, I think I'm getting a lot done, but then when I actually look at everything that I've gotten done, I haven't really, like, I can get little things done, um, but ultimately, like, the big things that require me to really focus don't get done, and you feel kind of hazy where you're like, I did start this task, but where did I get with it? Um, because I got distracted by something else. So, how many people have ever like checked email or Slack at a meeting? See, that's multitasking. You might not think of it as multitasking, but you have to break your concentration from the meeting to do that, and then you have to go back to it and. But that's not all you're doing. You're like you're like looking at your email, pretending to pay attention to the conversation, and then you're like done checking your email and resuming the conversation. But now you have to pretend that you weren't. Or Check worse, someone email. calls on you and you have no And you're idea. like, shit, I heard my name. <laughs> yeah. 
So I used to really, really love multitasking. Um, I thought it made me really productive because I could be like, hey, I worked on 30 projects today. I'm really productive. My boss actually encouraged this. And there was a week where I was like trying to complete 20 projects simultaneously and I got it done. And like my boss was really happy with this. And he's like, yeah, you got it done. So you should do this next week, right? <laughs> like, you can do 20 projects a week, huh? Yeah. Uh, but that brings a question up of what actually is done? Like, what does done mean? Um, and so, like, we always have more work to do. <laughs> and the problem with multitasking, and it took me a long time to come to this conclusion, because like I said, I really loved multitasking. Like, this was awesome. I'd come in, I'd have, like, you know, this, you know, the, the, the activities I was going to do today, and I'd just switch between activities all the time, and be bored with one thing, move to another. And so, it took me a while to realize that multitasking is an illusion. It doesn't actually save any time. Um, in agile parlance, we have this concept of uh, work in progress. And so, like, think about the number of tasks you're doing per hour, per day, per week, and per month. And work in progress is an agile term that basically says, what are you juggling? And that doesn't include like the little things you're doing, like checking Slack, checking Instagram, checking Twitter. Uh, what are the little things you do? So checking Slack, checking Twitter, checking Instagram, <laughs> checking my phone literally every time it buzzes. Now that I have a watch, it also buzzes. I remember you two gave a talk at MidCamp last year, which was like, how many notifications do you get? And we went into settings and you had like 9,000, but I had like 2,000 notifications a week. And I was like, Ooh, we need to talk about this. Like this is really bad. Um, but I have another strategy similar to this one and it's like uh, at my previous role we were juggling a lot of different contexts so we were doing like technical work but also presenting to stakeholders and something that we did every morning was like most important task and so we would share with each other what our MIT was and it was like the one thing that you had to focus on to get done for that day so that you could feel good about you know the day but also that you wouldn't get distracted by all these other things that were also due in the next few weeks but like Pick one, get it done. Um, and when I started working at Pantheon, one of my coworkers does this 80-20 rule where he picks one that he can do 80% and one that he can do 20% and he works on these two tasks for the day. Um, so there's different strategies to like have a number of things to focus on. So speaking of strategies, computers are really, really good at this. Humans are not. So if you're working on a task and you want to switch tasks, you effectively have to save your workspace. So all the open files, <laughs> basically make a copy of the RAM that exists inside your head, load some other RAM. Now they have apps for that, that's the worst part. Well, but you've got to, you've got like mentally, forget mentally about like, too, you know, yeah. even if you've just got paper in front of you, you've got to mentally task switch, task switch again. Then when you want to go back, you've got to like put all that aside, you've got to stop thinking about it and come back over here and start thinking about this again. It's actually really hard to do that. Humans are incredibly bad at this. Computers are great, like computers do this easily. But humans, like if I tell you not to think of a unicorn, everyone just thought of a unicorn. <laughs> like it doesn't work. You can't just turn off thinking about a task when your brain is involved in it. Um, where, what actually happens here is bad. Um, if you are working on one project at a time, you are focused on that project at 100%. If you're working on two, the actual time you can focus on any one project drops down to 40% because you have a fee of 20% due to context switching. Your ability to change now is being eaten up by 20%. And of course, at five projects, you're losing 75% of your time context switching. And so, you'll, you, you know, if anybody's ever like been like ingrained in work, <coughs> a text message or a notification, it's like, crap! Or a meeting invite. Or a meeting invite. That's and like in like 30 they, minutes. Yeah. They get frustrated <laughs> like, at it. No. And it's like, no, I'm yeah. here. And there goes my project. Fast. And then you go into the meeting, and you can't really focus on that because you're thinking about your project, and you can't do that because you're in a meeting. So there was actually a, a research project that does this. And group A was given a task of when a light comes on, just press a button. Pretty simple task. Light turns on, press a button. Like this big red button here. Um, <laughs> group B had two lights and two buttons, and they had to press a button based on the amount of time it took, or based on the light that came on. Also a simple task. 
But group B took twice as long. It's technically the same thing. Light comes on, press button. But it required the ability to context switch between what button and what task. It wasn't just a simple trigger. Um, Lots of people say, hey, I've got, a, I've got a multitask to keep up. Like, I can't do this unless I multitask. But you're losing your time due to the context switching problem. Uh, this was posted on a door um, in my office building. And it's kind of where this is. Uh, the concept here being, if I've got another task I've got to do, I'm going to overflow. I'm going to have to stop doing work. I'm not going to be able to continue working here. Um, Fundamentally, humans are really bad at controlling what we do and when we do it. Uh, we have this ongoing issue with handling work in an appropriate manner. Uh, it's really stressful at times. Um, I've seen this too. Have you ever had to take work home or felt the need to take work home? I feel like I'm a recovering workaholic. Uh, this is the first time I've had a job that's only been 60 days that I... <laughs> Okay, that's a lie. I do take my work at home, but not as much as I used to. Like it used to be, like I used to work nine to like eight p.m. But you know, the work never gets done. The client wants it tomorrow, and then I'd be like, I'm just gonna go home have dinner, and then I won't work on it. But as soon as I have dinner, I open a laptop. It's not my work laptop, but I can still work on the project. And then I'm just like working till eleven. And so like the more this went on, like I didn't have time for family. Like social activities were like delegated to the weekends. We started working on Sundays. Like. It was not healthy at all. And then when you're doing things like contribution and community, so it's like I used to go to work and then I'd go home, I'd work on triple diversity, and then I'd sleep and then I'd repeat and I didn't have time for friends or family. If I had to travel, it was a disaster. If anything bad happened in my life, like, like a personal crisis, it was suddenly like I couldn't do all the things because I had never made space for anything other than work and volunteer work, which is also work. and. And I treated like Drupal events, like vacations. Um, they're not, they're just more work. And so I just, I got to a point where when my last job ended, like the contract ended, I was like, that's it. I am taking months off and I am just gonna travel and do nothing. And then I traveled and I was like, it's been a month, I can't do this anymore, I need to work. And so like that, it kind of highlighted the problem because before that I was like, I'm not a workaholic, like I don't have a problem. I just, I'm really productive. I just really like to work. I'm passionate about what I do. <laughs> but really it's that like, I never gave my time, myself time for anything else. And so now if my friends are like, so what do you do for fun? And I'm like, I, I don't know, but I'm figuring that out. Like now I have all this free time after five. So my office closes at six. Um, that like I can finally do other things. So, so don't take your work home. As you're hearing, there's two <laughs> things that happen here when you do too much work. One, your work quality suffers. You're not doing yeah. good work if you're working all the time. You just can't. You just can't do it. Yeah, you spend like eight hours on a back end development ticket that you could have done in two hours had you done it the next day in the morning. Um, and you have health and safety, like personal health and safety issues, but, and also depending on the type of work, you might have actual health and safety issues. What is your, you know, how many people have ever pulled an all-nighter? How many people at like, you know, three in the morning thought they were doing their best work? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, but not to like shit on anyone that needs alternative schedules, because I do so, know people who work on different schedules. But like an all-nighter implies you worked all day, yeah, and then you no, worked all that. night. <laughs> no, it, it's fine if you you know want to if, start working at, at like three a.m. Yeah, yeah, that's and like totally work cool. through the night. But that's not like an all-nighter implies you, you spend all day sleep. working, and you're going to spend all night working. And then of course, when you get up, you know, the next morning you probably have something due or some you know client meeting. So are you in a great position to meet with a client when you haven't had sleep? No, nope. probably not. Nope. It's not a great. Way not to when you have three projects and you can't remember which one this meeting's for. <laughs> So there's also some hidden costs here, um, and probably the biggest hidden cost is like I don't know I'm passionate about this, and it's technical debt. Everybody familiar with this term? So technical debt is this concept of the it, it, well. So the example I give here is basically think about a project you've worked on a year ago. If I found an issue with it now, how long would it take you to fix it? Versus how long would it have taken you to fix the it a year ago when you were actively still working on it? And so technical debt is this concept of short-term cuts at long-term, or short-term time-saving exercises at long-term gains. I'm sorry, at long-term expense. Let me not get that wrong. So <laughs> it's a little bit like financial debt. 
You make a decision to go into debt. You go to the bank, you ask for a loan. You are aware that there is going to be an interest rate that you have to pay on that loan. When you take that loan in your mind, you are planning to pay that interest over time. Because you know you need a loan, you're going to have a paycheck, and you're allocating a portion of your paycheck to pay it down. The difference with technical debt is often it's not a manager or even a CEO or an executive member making the decision to take on that debt. Can you imagine at your companies, depending, assuming you're not in a leadership role, going to a bank and signing a loan on behalf of your organization. If I walked into a bank and I said, hey, I need a loan for the University of Michigan of a million dollars, and I signed, you know, Michael Hess, official University of Michigan, I would be out of a job so quickly. <laughs> um, but when you take on technical debt on behalf of your organization, and you don't explain that to your leadership, that's what you're doing. You are committing the organization to a future expense at and if they don't know about it, they don't budget accordingly for it. Are there any fun technical debt stories? I've worked mostly in government. Oh. It's more like it gets handed to me. Yeah. <laughs> well, and so then in my case, like when I was younger, I had a hard time kind of saying that to people and specifying like, hey, the reason why it takes so long to like repair your server is because there is no documentation for your server. And I have to go through the entire building to figure out who owns this, how to access it, how to fix it. And so... Yeah, speak up, speak early, estimate the amount of time you think it will take. If you don't know, like, be really explicit and honest about that and get support. So, you know, it, it, this gets to the question that I asked earlier, what is actually done? What defines done? So if you do a task and it's ready to go live, but you know you have a ton of future work to clean it up, is it really done? Nope. <laughs> so no, some really. of my favorite causes to this, uh, lack of standards. So just having a lack of coding standards or a lack of like how you're going to do certain tasks, it leads to this because you've got multiple people who are all doing it differently. Mm -hmm. um, creating future unplanned work. So it's one thing to say, hey, we'll fix that in phase two because that's an appropriate project management strategy to limit scope creep. It's different to say, we'll write the documentation tomorrow because it's never going to get written. Yeah. Uh, like setting deadlines, people who aren't actually doing the work, this happens a lot at agencies that I've worked at where, you know, like a project manager will set a deadline and a budget for a technical project without consulting the dev on the project. And it's kind of like ridiculous because I'm the one who has to do all the work and I know how long it's going to take, but now I have to work according to someone else's schedule. Um, so that just burns me out in the end. Uh, and then too much complexity. <laughs> yeah. So like over complexity on things, like just takes longer to do everything. Um, it's okay to simplify your things. And not have things like tightly coupled. Like it just makes it easier to like move them into other things and reuse things. Uh, lack of testing, any type of testing. Like you <laughs> that need, never gets done. Yeah, you need some type of testing. It takes time in the moment, but long term it saves countless bugs, errors, and speeds things along. Um, High work in progress almost always leads to technical debt. The higher your work in progress, the more technical debt you have to generate by definition. Because what you're doing is you're saying, I'm done because I can go to my boss and say, hey, I finished this project. And my boss, assuming they're non-technical, is going to look at it and say, yep, I can show that to a client. But meanwhile, you have no documentation. You have no tests. The code barely works. You don't know the code barely works because you haven't tested the code. And so you have this, like, you know, you're sitting in that client meeting, and your boss is demoing this, and you're just sitting there praying. <laughs> that they click on the specified button. <laughs> oh, um, don't click to the left. <laughs> something that I've experienced with this is like being a lone developer in many cases, like on a team, um, and having to like communicate about this is kind of like you can start early by saying like, what is our definition of done? Like, what does success looks like to us? and include your developer in that, or if you are the developer, make sure that you're like, hey, if you want this to be a like robust product, we need testing. Here's how long it will take for this to have testing in it at a sufficient amount. And so like having that definition and making sure everyone's on the same page. I had this really weird incident when during my Code for Canada fellowship where the designer and I did not both define that. And so halfway through our fellowship, she was like, oh, we're launching publicly. And I was like, of course, it's an app. 
like we're working for a government agency. We are going to launch this thing. And like halfway through a deadline project to understand that we were not on the same page as far as like launch and what it takes to launch uh, was a learning moment. <laughs> um, Business Insider calls technical debt the hidden company killer <laughs> because executives aren't really aware of what it is and what it means. And so they end up building up a massive amount of technical debt to move things quickly, and then they want to make changes, and they can't iterate quickly. And so you'll see this happen a lot. We'll, we'll speed to get to market, we'll get to market, and we'll realize that our customers actually want something a little bit different. And then they'll want to make quick changes to it, and they can't because the code's a mess. Yeah. And so you know it kills a company off. Uh, one of the easy ways to think about this is the smell test. Um, how long do you think a task should take versus how long does it take? And so, you know, if you think to yourself, I've got a website actually, it's a great example of this, where they wanted to change the color of the background. And anybody who knows CSS, this is an easy change to make. You just go in, you change the color of the background, you save the file, maybe you run an automated test. You know, uh, if you asked a room of developers and said, give me a time estimate, you know, you would expect that estimate to be under five hours. Estimate I gave for this was 100 hours. And, you know, the other developer in the room looks at me and goes, what are you smoking? <laughs> 100 hours to change a background color on a web page? Like, yeah, that's about right for that site. Website was developed by somebody who basically exported, I don't know, 1,000 pages from some online tool. There's a dedicated CSS sheet for every page that got exported. So if you want to change the background color, you can't just change it in your CSS file. You have to change it in every page's CSS file. Now, maybe you could write an automated script that would go through and do that. But unfortunately, the div names were all random. So like, <laughs> it, would be, like, it would be difficult to do it. You probably could do it. But either way, you're going to have an enormous amount of either going through and manually changing it or writing some type of automated code to do it for you and testing. It is not a straightforward fix to do that. That's a great example of technical debt. That one is so good. <laughs> yeah, I can't top that. So, 100 hours to change the fact. So far, well, like, I mean, yeah. so far we've been pretty, like, negative towards technical debt. Like, we've made this sound bad, but it's not always bad. Sometimes it is appropriate to take on technical debt. Sometimes that is an appropriate business decision to do. If you've got a hard deadline, and you need to make the deadline, it's okay to say, look, we're going to go ahead and take on the technical debt to get this done quickly. We're not going to write tests. We're, well, don't skip the tests. We're going to skip the documentation. Uh, we're going to, you know, not make this work in IE6, whatever it may be. Um, and in exchange, we're going to get this, we're going to meet this deadline. That's okay if everyone's aware of what that truly means. So in the same way, a company may say, hey, in order to bring our product to market, we need to go get a loan of a million dollars. The executive team is going to talk about that. They're going to say, yep, this, makes like, this is a good business decision for us to do, and they'll take the loan out. Whereas with us, with technical debt, it's pretty much the same way. You just have to make sure that everyone's aware of it. Have you ever had to explain technical debt to a manager? I always find this like a hard conversation to have. I think there's one way where you're like, didn't, didn't you do an activity with your class? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was going to add something different, but like something that I try to do at Pantheon, because as developer relations, there's like a lot of different pieces of work. Um, there's like talking to people, there's writing documentation, and there's giving presentations and trainings. And so it feels like a lot of context. Um, on my sprint board for every two weeks, I have a tag called net new. And so for every two weeks, I will only have one net new item in my log. Like everything else has to be something that I'm adding to and not like a new project or a new engagement or a new type of training because more than one net new item means I'm going to be doing two really big things for two weeks. And that's like, I've noticed that isn't feasible for me as like new to the company to take that on more than one. So, so how many people brush their teeth? And, and for those of you who've seen my slides before, no, that slide is not coming. <laughs> uh, so, brushing your teeth takes time. Hopefully you're spending you know, at least four minutes a night with your teeth brushing ritual. If I made the proposal to you all that says, you know what, let's save some time. We're going to skip brushing our teeth to save 28 minutes uh, in a week. 
You don't look at me like I'm crazy. Like, <laughs> wait, no. You, what? No, you're gonna get cavities. Like, there's all sorts of downstream effects from that. But I'm saving 30 minutes. Well, yeah, but 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 if I save the 30 minutes and I brush my teeth once a week, even if I brush my teeth for 30 minutes at the end of the week, one, I'm not really saving the time because I'm gonna make it up at the end of the week. But two, if I end up getting a cavity, the amount of time it's gonna to take to fix the cavity, the amount of pain I'm gonna go through in fixing said cavity. Uh, is not worth it. But we make this decision with our projects all the time. We cut corners to save five minutes here, 10 minutes there, an hour there. But at some point in the future, we end up having to pay that down. We end up having to like go back and that. If you've ever had to work on an old software project that wasn't really done to like what we would call standards, even if they're not today's standards, the standards at the time the software was built, like the amount of time you spend doing that is huge. So, you know, if you get anything out of this, brush your teeth every night. <laughs> Um, high work in progress, combined with high technical debt, almost always lead to burnout. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind, and this graph is a little small, but basically there's this assumption that you can knock on somebody's door and ask a question, and your interruption is only five minutes long. But the problem with this is somebody's working, and they're in the zone, you interrupt them. Yes, your interruption takes five minutes, but the recovery back to productivity takes significantly longer. And so one of the things that's easy to do is just put a sign that says, don't disturb me now, I'm working. And if you're gonna do that, that also means closing your email, closing Slack, <laughs> turning your phone off. Um, one of the things I'm challenging my students to do uh, is I'm gonna ask them to go four days without a cell phone. And you know, if you, if you say that in front of a room of students, and I'm looking at people's faces now, there's like, <laughs> horror on their faces. Four days without a cell phone? How would we do that? Well, why can't you not be interrupted for four days? Like, you can still check your email on a computer, you just don't have it literally clipped to your hip all the time. What's the longest you've been without a cell phone? Probably 24 hours. But I had a dad who called often. Now you can take it away and I wouldn't care. So that's the guy who has three cell phones. <laughs> Four now, thanks. Probably <laughs> all on him yeah, right now, too. Else but also, since the morning, I've seen you stuck to your phone. Like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> Twitter. What about our watch? Oh, well, as long as the phone is with we'll it. turn the phone off. I can uh, check my emails. Uh, I was going to say, things that we do at the office, like don't disturb someone who has their headphones on. Uh, we use color, so like if your Slack status is red and your Slack is like you're away, that's like I'm I heads down, no interruptions, please. Yellow is kind of like I'm working hard, but I'm interruptible. So to make it a little bit hard for someone to interrupt you if it's not urgent. Um, and then green's like I'm good to chat, which no one really uses, but yellow and red I like to use a lot. Um. So work in progress, if you've got something that's half done, it's not done. You can't get business value out of something that's half done. So do the work fully and correctly the first time. Don't like say, oh, I'll go back to this later. Uh, let's play a game. Uh, we're gonna give your team three projects to do. Your boss basically says, here are your three projects, and they are all of equal priority. And all of the stakeholders behind these projects want these done right now. So I don't want you to do one project at a time. I want you to do uh, each phase of the project and then switch to the other phase. And so let's just assume that you know, you're gonna do A1, then B1, then C1. And so what we have here is we've got A1, B1, C1, A2, B2, C2, A3. When A3 is done, we can deliver value to the customer for Project A. So the stakeholder for Project A is happy when A3 is done, which by this is you know mid-May. Then when B3 is done, Project B is done, so the stakeholder's happy. And when C3 is done, the stakeholder is happy with C3, which here is July, so six months. If we don't task switch, if we just do project A, then project B, then project C, we get significantly further along because we don't have to actually have the mental hoops of task switching. Also keep in mind here that, you know, just because the developer's done with project A, someone else is gonna probably go and present that to the client. So A1 is done, a project manager, maybe the developers involved, is going to go present that to the client while B1 is working. But that doesn't mean there's not going to be questions from that client in real time. So we are saving time by doing the priorities, by just prioritizing the projects in any way. 
yes, you're going to have to tell the person who's C1 that they're not going to get their project done by April until April, but they're going to have it done by May as opposed to July if you do them all simultaneously. I've done this multiple times with different projects. This actually does work. It feels like, oh, I'm not, you know, like when I go back to multitasking, it feels like, oh, I'm not doing all the projects I need to do. I'm putting it off a few weeks. You are, but you're going to give it 100% of your focus. You're not going to have to pay for the task switching costs. Um, to put this in, like, take-home chores, if you have to make a child's costume, buy some canned soup, and pay some bills, and water the plants, if you only do half of these tasks, <laughs> you don't have them done. So just buying the supplies to make the costumes and making the pants part of the costumes, your child can't go out without a shirt on. Like, they're not going to be happy with you. If you're going to, you know, pay some bills and you write the check, but, you know, I don't want to mail it, I'll mail it tomorrow. That bill is not paid. Um, you've done an enormous amount of work, but you haven't actually gotten anything done. You've got delivered no value to yourself. Um, Rework is always bad. Uh, rework is when you have high work in progress and you have to start something over. Uh, let's do some math. This is my favorite slide. Uh, you have a 20-person company. How many people work in a 20-person company or a 20-person team or thereabouts, if not adjust accordingly? You have 35 usable hours in a week. So you pay people for 40 hours a week typically, but they've got five hours for lunch or an hour a day for lunch, so you get 35 hours of you know, usable time from the person a week. Average cost per human hour is $75. That includes the office space, the benefits, all the things together. So just, you know, it's an average. You have three projects per person, okay? You have a 40% loss of context switching according to the peer-reviewed research. But if you're going to you know, say, well, I don't, I don't believe it's that high, great. Let's call it 30% loss of context switching due to the three projects. It is 40%, but let's call it 30%. So 20 people times 35 hours a week is 700 human hours in your company per week. 210 of those hours are lost to context switching. We throw them away. 210 times 75 is 15 grand a week that you are throwing away because you have your people doing too many things simultaneously. 15 grand a week, assuming there's 50 work weeks in a year, is a little over a quarter of a million dollars that your company is just tossing away. <laughs> Wasted. <laughs> have you ever made a mistake because you're tired? Always. <laughs> That's when all the accidental deploys to production have happened. <laughs> no, I once I, I was new at Echidna and I was working on fixing a bug for feeds. Like for some reason the feed wasn't importing into the site. Um, and the only way to test it was on production and I accidentally deleted the import. <laughs> yeah, and then no one else was in the office and I was like, shit, I just started here. What do I do? Called the project manager. They were like, oh, that's happened before. <laughs> Because this site always has feed problems, and we always give it to the junior devs who don't know what to do with it. And I was just like, wow, this is really sad. And so the next day, like a senior developer had to take time out of her schedule, which led to work in progress for her to help me fix it. But so a site you had had a bunch of technical debt on Never it. do it at 9 p.m. when no one else is in the office, and you're tired and stressed <laughs> and like really desperate to show them that you work really hard. But was that stressful for you? Very. Yeah, so, I could have quit. Like I was so scared to go to work the next day. <laughs> high work in progress leads to high stress, which oh. leads people to take shortcuts. But most importantly, Maybe it costs. <laughs> It causes unhappy staff. You know, I had a junior developer who one time, he didn't know how to fix an error, didn't want to talk to me about it, was really stressed out because his performance wasn't that great. He uh, display none all errors on the production site <laughs> and pushed it and thought I wouldn't notice. And I was kind of like, we need to chat. Like, And he was like, I'm so stressed. And I was like, take a week off. Like, <laughs> go do some training, feel better, come back. Like, don't display none error messages. <laughs> um... Mistakes, if you're doing like medical work, can actually be <laughs> fatal here, like literally fatal. Uh, and so one of the things here, some tips here, and we're gonna go through these relatively quickly, uh, prioritize your work. Um, this is the number one thing. Just make sure your work is in the priority order of the value it delivers to your business, and do the work in that order. Um, 
understand the business value behind all the projects you're working on. If you can't point to the business value of the work you're doing, you probably shouldn't be doing it. Um, yeah, uh, close your email, put your Slack on do not disturb, don't be afraid to use the snooze functionality. Like your time is valuable and, and you know, treat it that way and don't let people interrupt you uh, during your work. Oh, <laughs> so uh, something that we've tried to do a to have like asynchronous meeting is threaded meetings in Slack. Uh, the Drupal diversity group kind of coined this in, in the Drupal community where, you know, we'll have this meeting at noon every Thursday um, and we'll just post each thread as a like discussion. Uh, so people can check in as they're having lunch, people in other time zones, like now I'm on Pacific and it happens at nine in the morning and I'm just like, I can't make that time, but I can check in at my lunch time and just leave comments, and so the discussion continues, and the thread also lives on, and so. You don't have to interrupt the work you're doing to attend a meeting. It's like very that's, exciting. That's huge. <laughs> um, keep a Kanban board and limit what's in each column. You talked about doing this actually already. Yeah. Where here are your Kanban boards, and you're not going to add something if the column's full. So you know you're going to have a minimum of whatever your minimum is, and you're going to set it. And no work can come in without pulling something out. And you just tell your manager or boss, "Hey, these are my limits. If you want me to do something else, pull something out of here." Um, if it gets really, really <laughs> bad, leave. Your mental health is not worth whatever job you're working at. Like it's just that simple. If your job can't hire the appropriate number of people it requires to do the work, mm -hmm. that's not your problem. Um, so this is really hard for me. As I <laughs> mentioned, I might have multiple phones on me. Uh, but limit the number of times you interrupt yourself. And like, if this feels like really uncomfortable, schedule a time on your calendar. After like three to four weeks, you might just get used to having that one time where you check your email. And so our takeaways here, keep the work in progress you're doing low, monitor your technical debt, prioritize your projects, and keep a solid work-life balance. Which is you're, really hard. Yeah, it really is. So you don't burn out. Like that's the fundamental thing here. You don't want to feel like you're running on a treadmill all the time. Any questions? <laughs> yes, Dan. Will you do the four days without your phone? No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, one little, uh, not a question, but just a toss in on sleep. Uh, if anyone's ever heard of uh, Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker, uh, definitely read that. You'll never pull on a lighter. <laughs> I think that's like trending in airports right now because I think I just saw it at SFO. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, I was like, mm, I should read that book, but I think it won't be too real. <laughs> no, you'll read now I'll go back and get it. Yeah. Every day. Any other questions? Thank you everybody for your time. Thank you.